We are here at Campo with Chef Alex Strada. How are you doing today? Great, thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. This is one I'm personally excited about, not only because of all of your accolades and whatnot, but we've got a new Italian restaurant here. I actually do work with Phoenix Beer Co. right over there, and I didn't know that this is where the new location was, so it's mm -hmm. cool to see you here in this little complex. That's a great little place, too. Yeah, and great what people. was here before? Uh, this used to be a melting pot back in, I think it was here for 20 years. Yeah, I remember going there for a few um, big events, dates, things like that. So it's it's good to see another, you know, local restaurant that's going to be even more delicious than it was before and in you its know, place. Yeah, we cook for you here. You don't have to cook for yourself. <laughs> yeah, <so>. exactly right. <laughs> Is that a running joke you guys have? <laughs> no, but I just made it up. So it's good. <laughs> well, there you go. There you go. Marcy, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. How are you? Doing good. For anyone that doesn't know listening to the podcast, Marcy is one of our writers for A Taste of AZ magazine. She does wonderful work, deep dives into some of the many people that keep this Arizona food and business, uh, food and beverage business running along. Uh, so check her articles out in recent issues of A Taste of AZ magazine and upcoming issues as well. Thank you. So as I said, we are here with Chef Alex Strada. Why don't you tell me a little bit about the place that we are here right now? Sure. Well, Campo is a um, neighborhood Italian bistro. We feature fresh pasta, fresh pizzas. We make everything here. Um, we are very focused on <clears throat> fitting into the neighborhood where people come here for happy hour. We're open from 3 o'clock till <clears throat> 10 o'clock, basically closed Mondays to rest a little bit, but we have happy hour during the week, which is doing very well from three to six. And people come here to have some, you know, some drinks and some snacks that we do at a discount. And we have great pizza and, and bottled beer, uh, bottled wine program. Uh, where you can get a pizza and a bottle of wine for 25 bucks, so oh, it's wow. perfect for two people. Yeah, um, you know, it's it's a place where we I want people to feel comfortable, where there's identifiable food, where um, they know they can come for quality, and and not break the bank doing it. So, uh, sure, it's been a it's been a very good success so far. Thank goodness. And so this is kind of a um, a newer evolution in your career if i'm not mistaken that's a little bit more uh not so fine dining oriented a little dialed back and a little bit more casual would you agree with that oh 100 percent. i mean it was part of the plan you know i had worked in the high-end <coughs> restaurant business my whole life my whole professional life and the fact that i felt kind of pigeonholed into that super high-end stuff with the foie gras and the caviar and all that you know it wasn't really it was my education, but it wasn't really where I felt the food in my heart, which for me was about simple, recognizable, delicious, regional, seasonal, uh, you know, great food with where, where people can actually enjoy. Like, I don't crave foie gras, you know, but I do crave a good lasagna. You know that kind right of thing, there with you. Or, or you know <laughs> minestrone. I'd rather have uh, caviar. I could probably crave, but you know I'd like to have a big bowl of minestrone rather than some fancy cream sauce, cream soup. You know, so mm -hmm. that's really how I I eat and that's how I cook now. And I've always, you know, the evolution started from when I left. Uh, well, when I had both Alex, which was a two-star Michelin French super fancy restaurant, and then I had Strata, which was this high-volume Italian restaurant. And I'm like, you know, not only does this make sense for me, but uh, if anybody listening is uh, in the restaurant business, <laughs> I'll tell you, you know, the Italian restaurant makes a lot more sense financially than a very high-end French restaurant. Hmm. So as a, as, a per, as a private business person, you know, uh, there's the practical component of running a business as well. And so not only is it more practical in you know the operation side of things but it also sounds like it's more of a reflection of what you like to eat not only what you like to cook but what you like to see on a plate yourself it is and you know being being a father of 12 uh, excuse me of 13 year olds now i, I thought you were going to say a father of 12 kids no and no like, Good oh goodness God, and no running a restaurant <laughs> no, that would be running a restaurant having 12 Seriously. kids <laughs> you know i have 13 year olds that uh you know i go out to dinner a lot but mostly with them Mm. And, you know, they have pretty simple palates. And, and, and I, I start to see restaurants with really great food where I don't expect it. I'm like, well, you know what? There's really good food at this, this level, uh, you know, of, 
of I wouldn't say family dining, but certainly casual dining, where you know you go for great chicken wings and you know go for a great tacos, and that's what I love about Phoenix. And I wanted to fit into Phoenix, not ha- not be an anomaly of that high end place that you have to kind of search. I want to be a place where you come two or three times a week or twice a month would be great. Uh, yeah, know, for recognizable stuff. I think that's one of the awesome things about Arizona is we really have so many different types of food. You bring up chicken wings and tacos, which are two very different styles of food, um, but something that you can find in almost any city in Arizona, whether it be here or down in Tucson or up in Flagstaff. There's just there's great food all over the place, and um, the the local side of it. And you were talking about the regional, the seasonal. That's something that you see growing more and more in Arizona, I think, as well, because more farmers are rising up and producing those local and seasonal ingredients. And it's a, it's an exciting thing to see. Marcy, have you been to this or any of the other restaurants of chefs? I have. Uh, I w- we were talking about it earlier uh, when in the 90s, we used to go to Mary Elaine's, which was, I think, one of the most incredible, sexy restaurants in town. And then one time we my husband and I were in Vegas and we went to um, we went to Alex for dinner and uh, also last year I came here to Strata Kitchen so I'm a big fan of his cooking over the years uh, I guess you. since 93 so it's been really interesting to follow his his path and uh, just this this restaurant is so beautiful and uh, I'm really excited uh, to be able to feature it and to tell Phoenix about it. Yeah, well, it almost feels like a, um, a modern oasis, if you will, where you walk in and you got the nice green plants and all that, and it feels, it has the, the natural touches to it. Um, like the, the bar itself has the patinaing on the, is that copper? Is that a copper bar? There, there's a copper top, and then there's some kind of rustic gold, uh, um, like, tiles that uh, look yeah. very weathered although they are brand new <laughs> it, well it it all comes together very well which is one of yeah. the most important parts of creating a a restaurant experience as i'm sure you're well aware mm-hmm. of at this point um and you know we were talking before we got on about all the little details even the soap dispensers are awesome and feel like when you squeeze a little button down they look like a like an old school seltzer bottle when you squeeze it down you just feel elevated almost so let's take it way back uh, tell me a little bit about growing up and at what point did cooking become a big part of your life? Well, I was, um, I am a fifth generation hotel restaurant uh, okay. business family. I'm from a, a long line of hoteliers and restaurateurs, mostly hotel, um, dating back, gosh, hundreds of, couple of hundred years in Italy, um, where the northern Italian uh, component of my cooking has come out. My family had a hunting lodge called La Superga, which was uh, where the royal family of Italy used to go hunting during season. And uh, from there, my uh, my family's been in the business the whole time. And so I was ba- basically practically born and definitely raised in a hotel till I was about uh, 12 years old or so. And, and really nice hotels, you know, kind of like... Uh, you know, the Excelsior Hotel in Rome and the Acapulco Princess in Acapulco. And just really, um, hospitality has always been part of who I am. I've probably ate more three meals a day in restaurants till I was about 10 years old. Hmm. You know, breakfast, lunch, and dinner every day and or by the poolside, you know, when I was in Mexico. And so it's always been a part of me. And then um, since I had kind of a leg up on it because of my languages and understanding of of, uh, specifically French and Italian cooking, uh, it was an easy transition for me to go to culinary school. I had already been working about five years before I decided to go to culinary school. And uh, from there, uh, my career really took off through getting an experience, an opportunity to uh, do an apprenticeship in Monte Carlo and Monaco with Alain Ducasse, which is a luminary in our business. And I fell in love with it, and they liked me, and I stayed there for two years instead of two months. At the Hotel de Paris? Yes, okay. and I lived at the Hotel de Paris for two months, too. 
uh, which sounds glamorous, but it was that was it was room and board, and that was it. So mm-hmm. the rest of it, I was on my own. But um, I uh, I fell in love with Mediterranean cooking. Absolutely, the just the reverence for the ingredients and and the culture and the history and the tradition and all that. There was just it's it's like opening a new book you never even thought you'd be interested in, and it just like just blew blew me away. And I just I got my hooks in it and uh, from then on I've pursued my passion and pursued you know excellence in my passion and um, you know landed a couple of really good lucky jobs Uh, one opening the Phoenician at the ripe age of 24 Um, that was probably I was a little ahead of my skis on that one but I somehow survived it and uh, my career took off uh, when I won the James Beard Award in 1998 and from then on it just it was an upward trajectory when I went to Las Vegas uh, to work for Steve Wynn there. And, uh, you know, I had, won, I had gotten five-star mobile at the time, which is now Forbes, at Mary Lane's. And uh, I had guaranteed Mr. Wynn that I would get him a, a five-star restaurant within the first year. So we opened Renoir, and I got five stars within the first four months. And... We were one of the first five-star restaurants in Las Vegas ever, uh, us and Picasso. And that really kind of put my uh, my career on, okay, now that we've did well in Phoenix, you know, you've got a really good shot at making an impact in Las Vegas. And I stuck to my guns, you know, no matter what I heard about people just coming there to steakhouses and stuff. I'm like, no, people, they're, they're sophisticated. They're gonna, they want to eat like this. I'm going to give them a world-class experience. And from there, um, you know, I uh, had a good relationship with, with the casino, and, and I had an opportunity to open Alex. And I told Mr. Wynn again, I said, okay, within six months, I'm going to get you a five-star restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> and within a year and a half, we were a two-star Michelin restaurant. Wow. Which I didn't even see that coming because I didn't even know they would they would come to the United States, much less to Las Vegas. Sure. And that really put us on the map. And then I had Strata Restaurant, which is, again, where I wanted to transition from always being fine dining into something a little bit more reachable. Uh, and my career has just been, you know, a lot of a lot of goods and a lot of bumps. But, uh, you know, here I am in Phoenix. I moved back five years ago. Um, trying to balance my life out a little bit and uh, I always have a passion and dedication you know just uh, at a different level but I I cook this with the same intensity Uh, I'll cook you a bowl of pasta with the same intensity as I'll cook anything in in any fine dining restaurant you know there's a right way and there's a wrong way and that's uh, that's how I was taught and I always try to do it the right way so circling back to those two months that turned into two years, when you're really developing a closer relationship with this food than you had before, I assume it's a combination of you not only producing all of the food, but also consuming the food as well. Am I right in thinking that? Very much so. I mean, it, it, it's, it's such a food culture, specifically the south of France and that whole Nice area. Because Monte Carlo is kind of, people have a vision of Monte Carlo that it's, you know, glamorous and which it is, and, you know, princes and yachts and stuff. But, um, you, you know, you go 20 miles either way and, and you're in the country. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, it's, it's either the south of France on, on a, on a, in Provence or in Ventimiglia in Italy where there's, you know, nothing but, you know, fishing and, 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 and farming. So <clears throat> that was the culture that I fell in love with. I mean, Niswa cooking in itself is so expansive because of all the, uh, you know, the ports in Marseille during the during the the trade. You know, everything came through Marseille at some point in history. So there's lots of spices. There's lots of North African influences. There's lots of Italian influences. They even their language in Nice is almost Italian slash French. You know, mm-hmm. so there's there's a lot of history there, and I had no idea. Yeah, there's a lot more depth to Mediterranean cooking than. People oh, really give credit. Absolutely. And I, I completely, I bought into the thing hook, line, and sinker. And I just dug into the culture, the lifestyle, the whole nine yards. And I walked out of there like with a new perspective on, on you know, what I wanted to do. Well, in the way you describe it, you can tell that it transcends beyond the food very deeply into the culture. You know, the, the ingredients coming in are very uh, intrinsic of where you are, obviously, being close to ports and all of that. So 
what is it like living day to day there when you're uh, going through this job, you know, I'm sure working your ass off. What does it feel like? Because you say, you know, you see the royals and the yachts and all that. What does it feel like being in that position? Well, you know, the the, the thing I wanted to also say with, with regarding the food and the culture is like, if you ask me what my best meal I've ever had in my life was, it was a peach in Ez Sur Mer. It was a peach with vanilla ice cream hmm. at this place called Ez. And the that encompasses my experience in Provence. It was like the absolute perfection of simplicity. As far as living there, you know, it's interesting when you're surrounded with all that kind of glitz and glamour, you kind of feel like it's you're, you're part of it. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> or you're like, can you, you don't even have enough money for beer. You know, it's, uh, you, you, we work for free. Uh, at least back in those days, uh, it was okay to have apprenticeships that seemed to have lingered on forever. Um, but it was great to be exposed to that level of, I mean, especially, you know, like royalty would come in for dinner. You know, not, you know, not your you know, celebrity this and that. It was like, you know, actual people that are royal. You know, it was interesting to see that level of lifestyle that, uh, you know, when there are yachts literally the size of hotels sitting outside, <laughs> there's helicopters on them. So it's kind of neat. And, but the greatest thing about it, that experience for me, was that at the time, Alain Ducasse was just emerging as somebody who's like, you know, had something going on. And he attracted a lot of American chefs like uh, Wolfgang Puck and Thomas Keller and Julian Serrano and Danielle Ballou and all these guys who are luminaries. They were coming to see, what is this guy doing? Mm-hmm. And I happened to be the American guy, and they're like, well, what are you doing here? You mm-hmm. know. So I had a lot of interest in, in plucking me out of there at the time, but I, I stuck it out with, with him and uh, ended up working with Danielle Ballou at, at Le Cirque anyway. But, uh, you know, it's, again, it was, it's about this, your surroundings and your environment that really creates a lot of, of, of who you can become. And I think being in that environment, you know, it's, it's, you know the finer things in life and you kind of aspire for them, you know. So were you born in Arizona? No, I was actually born in Wisconsin, okay. of all places. I mean, I was there for four months of my life, and then I moved uh, from Racine, Wisconsin, to Karachi, Pakistan. Uh, that's a stretch, but my father got his first uh, GM job back in the mid-60s um, as a general manager of the Intercontinental Hotel in, uh, in, in Karachi, Pakistan. So um, the first few months of my life, we lived in the States, and then I did not move back to the States till I was 12. So it was just bouncing around different restaurants that took you kind of around the world, gathering up all the experiences? Uh, yes, the hotels. I mean, everything from Malaysia to Singapore to Acapulco to Rome, uh, you know, you, you, we, we were all over the place. And so at what point did you kind of start to go on your own direction and separate from, you know, the family bringing you from place to place to really starting to chart your own path? Um, pretty early age. I, I, I started, I was on my own by the time, you know, I was the usual, like 18. But uh, I really, when I moved out here, um, when I was 24 is when I really, like, I, I, w- I was on my own. I had gotten this job that was way beyond my means I mean my, or my experience and I'm like I'm moving to Arizona and at the time we're thinking of all places you know I didn't when and you this th- is for the Phoenician yeah I mean back, you know for, for me I, I was I had such a different idea of Arizona like a lot of people still do like rattlesnakes and you know <laughs> it's and cowboys you know yeah. it's like that's what i thought i was going into and like i'm gonna go do it there and then i came here i'm like man this place is nice this is a really nice place to live i'm like i had it so wrong <laughs> uh and uh, so i've been i've been in love with it ever since well you say you know you separated and started going your own way around 18 as a normal age but Coming here to open up the Phoenician at 24 is definitely not a typical 24-year-old thing. So I'm curious, when you're, when you're going through these experiences, is it something where you have a little bit of a, a starstruck mentality where you're seeing these people, these high-profile individuals, and cooking for them and just going, you know, wow, this is something else? Or is it, did it get to the point where you were just kind of locked in and ready to keep things rolling whenever you had a new order come in? 
No, I, you know, I've always kept it. I, I, I will cook uh, with as much passion and intensity for <laughs> the queen of Egypt as I will for the next customer that walks in the door. Again, like I said, you know, it's doing it the right way or not. And I, I've always, I, I'm, I've always uh, described myself as a tradesperson, as a craft person, not necessarily as a celebrity or, or an entertainer. I've, I'm a craftsman, you know. I, like guys make great chairs, I, I make great food. You know, that's, that's what I do. Um, and anything that comes my way, whether it's a TV show or anything like that, that's all, that's all gravy, so to speak. Um, but it's all about the trade for me. It's all about the history and, and, and just the rigor of the kitchen. It's, 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 you know, it's not for sissies. There's a lot of work involved in, 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 in sticking to it. For so, I mean, I've been doing this for 36 years. You know, I, I hope I like it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? Well, I mean, when I make a, a few fillets for you know, me and some family members, I feel the pressure there. So I can't quite imagine what it would be like doing things on the scale you're doing it at. But Um, that passion is really what it comes down to, right? That's what pushes you through. So how has your passion, how did it kind of develop over the years? Did it, um, did it shift in certain directions? Like recently you've gotten more passionate and gone the direction of more casual dining. How did that evolve over time? Well, it varies, you know, it's kind of like once I, I discover or I'm exposed to something new, I'll dive a hundred percent into it. You know, I'm kind of a, black or white, zero to a hundred type of person anyway. Either I'm not paying attention at all or I'm going to be the next expert. <laughs> you know, it's like I'm going to dig in a hundred percent. So, you know, I can get on a kick on, on Thai food or Vietnamese food or, you know, North African food. I got on a kick on that one for all of a sudden all my food had spices in it. And I'm like, oh, maybe I overcorrected there, you know. <laughs> um, uh, so, so it, it's just about what what piques my interest the most, and now it's it's more about going back to basics. I mean, I hear so much, uh, so many of our customers going like, you know, basically relieved that I'm just cooking to back to what I started from, which is really really fundamental Italian cooking. So after the Phoenician, what kind of what directions do things go from there? Well, um, when I was asked to go to Las Vegas uh, by Steve Wynn after winning the Beard Award, um, I, oddly enough, had never been to Las Vegas. But for some distorted reason, I thought since I lived in Monte Carlo, I guess Vegas would be kind of like Monaco. (laughs) (laughs) Not really. So literally the first time I'd ever been to Las Vegas, I accepted a job. I'm like, sure, I'll do this. Because I, I really liked the guy, I liked Mr. Wynn right off the top, right off the bat. And, and what was and that like working for him? It was great. Yeah. I, I worked with him for 15 years, and, and you know he's an intense person who knows what he wants. And um, if you can deliver what he wants, you're very well taken care of, you know. And, and he gave me a dream. He's like, he basically said, I'm going to build you the restaurant, Alex. Anything goes. I mean, how can you say that's like, I'll just write you, I'll be, I'm a billionaire. I'm just going to write you a blank check. Like, I think I'll sign up for that. And I promised to deliver. And, and once I delivered, you know, we, we had a very good working relationship and became a friendship. Um, and, uh, you know, but, but the transition to Las Vegas for me was, was a shocker. I mean, um, I was, I thought it was busy at the Phoenician. I had no idea what busy is. I mean, you know, you can imagine the casino life is nonstop. And it was right at the cusp of, of you know, Bellagio was opening and Mandalay Bay and Paris. And I mean, 98 was like a boom mm-hmm. in Las Vegas. And then 2000 came and it was nuts. Um, and, you know, I stayed there the whole time. So it was cool. So for someone like myself that doesn't really know what it's like to run a restaurant like that in Vegas, give a little bit of context as to, you know, maybe how many dishes you were doing a night or how many people you were having to deal with. Well, the, the thing, the thing that's, that's, um, that's different about Las Vegas is I, I would say that there's some good and bad. The, the bad is that it, it's really, it can become quite a grind because it's kind of like Groundhog Day. You mm-hmm. know, every day is like the next. I mean, it's, it, is it Tuesday? Is it Saturday? Who knows? And who cares? It's just busy. Mm-hmm. Um, the stuff that wasn't as favorable about it was that there was very few repeat guests. 
unless they came, unless there were big gamblers who came often and often would be, you know, you'd see them once a month. So we couldn't establish the rapport, which I think is so important in developing a restaurant is that you can't establish that, you know, you know that Mr. Smith comes in and he likes Blonnie, Johnny Walker Blue and he sits at table 54 and his wife is allergic to peanuts. You know, those are the types of things that I make uh, important uh, points of uh, to develop a sense of genuine hospitality, which is kind of like, you know, it's Tuesday night, we have 200 covers and brace yourselves again. That's, you know, that's pretty much, but I never took the heart out of that because I knew I was making impact and through, and it's not me, I mean, through, through what I was delivering through other people. Uh, you know, I had great, great servers who understood, who, you know, that didn't take themselves very seriously, but they took their professional very seriously. Mm. It was really a great, I, I had a great experience in Las Vegas. So the moment I walked in and shook your hand, you seemed like a very warm, welcoming guy. And this place kind of emulates that. And then to hear the way you uh, speak about Mr. Wynn and about how you like to build a relationship with your customers, it seems like not only the food is in your blood, but as you mentioned before, the hospitality runs very deep with you. How are you just naturally a people person or is that something you had to develop over time, that love of taking care of people? No, I, th I think it, it stems from uh, something I learned at a very early age is the, the golden rule, you know, treat others like you want to be treated. And I want to be treated nicely. <laughs> sure. So I treat people nicely. And, and generally it's, it's a positive thing, you know. And so how did that kind of evolve over time, your ability to execute those kind of things, learning about your customers and ensuring that you can provide the experience that they would desire the most? Well, you know, it it's, it's comes down to practice and experience. You know, uh, as far as the cooking stuff, it's all about practice. I mean, they say, oh, my God, Alex, you're such a great cook. And it's like, well, if you've been doing it for 30 years, you might be pretty good at it yourself. You know, I mean, that's all there is to it is I was taught correctly. And as far as the, you know, as far as the hospitality component of it, um, you know, I, I, I just I really try to strive to do my best. Um, Sounds like it was in your blood. It was in my blood. It was in my With blood. Your father. I mean, you know, I, I opened doors mm -hmm. at a very early age, you know, mm -hmm. and it was that was something I just you're absolutely right. It was like part of our persona was, mm -hmm. you know, being hospitable and kind and gracious and making people feel welcome in your home because I didn't have a home. I would I was we were welcomed in our hotel, which they were paying money to get into. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it was just part of the deal. You know. Was that something that you grew up into, you know, obviously because of your family in large part, but was that part of the culture as well in the areas that you were in? Well, in, in the hospital, in our side, yes, because we were always on the, the giving end of, 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 uh, of that experience. Sure. So you, no matter who your clientele was, you were, it was always in a very high end, very, uh, let's just say, luxurious environment where, you know, luxury for me is service mm -hmm. you know and so it's 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 one of those things my father taught me very well i said you know that be, being kind and courteous costs you nothing sure and it's sometimes the most important thing about a restaurant or any business is feeling you know like you matter well and you can tell when a business or a business owner is value driven versus money driven and obviously any business is money driven in a sense but when, when a business owner is able to uh, impart their values on their business and still be a profitable company, that's when you get those experiences that are just so much more than going in somewhere to eat. It's, it's, it's exactly what you're saying. You want people to come in and be blown away by the food and feel taken care of. And unfortunately, a lot of restaurants and hotels don't operate with that mentality. Um, so once you get the James Beard Award and the Michelin stars and you open all the restaurants and your career, career is really, really thriving, at what point do you decide that you want to start kind of going back to your, the style of food that you like to eat, the more casual, if you will, end of things? Well, you know, I think it, was, it wasn't so much the food but the circumstances that, that kind of made me change gears a little bit. Um, back in 2007... Um, I was diagnosed with cancer, and that kind of gave me a bit of a shake-up. Uh, at the same time, my kids were being born. Uh, that certainly didn't make things any easier to deal with. And I just kind of 
you know, after being on the treadmill my whole life, I felt like a squirrel in, in, on the, you know, I said, you know, maybe you should slow down a little bit here. Were you in Vegas at this point? I was in Vegas at this point, and I was really at the top of my game. I mean, 2007, seven, eight, I was at the top of my game in a sense of, you know, whatever you want to call it, recognition or whatever. And, you know, I just had a kind of like, whoa, you know, why don't I continue doing what I do and love it and, you know, get off the high wire act, Mm -hmm. you know, where you're just like always on edge and always like, you know, I mean, it it, run a two star Michelin restaurant is not for everybody. I mean, it takes a tremendous amount of dedication. If you want to call it sacrifice, I don't know. Uh, But it takes it takes a tremendous lot of time. That's for sure. Um, and it usually that time takes away from other things you could be doing to have a balanced life. And I just said, I, I don't want to do this anymore, you know. And it slowly morphed into what we're doing now. So I couldn't be happier. I've never been happier in my life, you know. It's great. So as a business owner, trying to dial things back, that's, you know, easier said than it is done, at least in most circumstances. What is that like for you personally? And then in terms of actual execution of dialing things back, where do things go from there once you kind of make that decision? Well, you know, I, I, I didn't dial it back in, as far as the importance of any of this. I dial it back as far as how it, I let it affect me. <laughs> sure. You know, I don't get stressed out as much anymore. It's just as important. I'm just not going to drive myself nuts, which I think at some point when you do that high wire act, you have to have some level of, of crazy to be able to want to be like that all the time. Mm-hmm. And I did have that level of, of insanity and, and like just nonstop, you know, intensity, which, you know, wears on you for a bit. And uh, so I'm just as intense and just as focused. It's just, uh, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna let it, uh, you know, as a business person or a chef or as a, as a human, just rule my life, you know, mm-hmm. I need to have some kind of like, okay, like slow down, dude back off well and as someone who runs a business you know there gets to be points and you don't even have to run a business if you just have a career you love there get to be points where you almost see your entire life as your career your business or whatever you're working on and it it is a real um journey of personal development to be able to not only recognize that it is impacting your life maybe not always in a positive way and then to be able to begin to dial those things back and i think that's one of the most exciting things about running a business, at least in my experience, is the personal development that comes along mm-hmm. with doing that. Are there other things that you felt that there were, you know, aha moments, if you will, where you began to learn more about yourself as you were growing as a chef and a restaurateur? Sure. Well, what I would notice, if anything, is I, I, I've done this so long and gotten such acc- accolades and recognition that I started to identify with Chef Alex. Mm-hmm where it's like that was that was who I had become Mm -hmm. and then how about dad or how about Mm -hmm. Alex the guy with the (laughs) car or whatever you know Mm -hmm. what it was always chef Alex I'm like there's a lot more to it than that then I started looking at my life and going like no that's pretty much what you do Mm -hmm. (laughs) it's so and that's when I scale back a little bit and believe me I'm, I'm I think I'm never I've never been put out better food than ever and I'm just not you know I guess it takes time and involvement and, you know, age and whatever you want to call it. But, you know, I, 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 my best case scenario is to be able to teach somebody what I was taught mm-hmm. uh, and, and pass that on. And I think that in our business, we could talk about that till, for a long time that, you know, that that uh, has become diluted quite a bit um, because of the focus on bottom line and and. and the, the ease of education these days. I mean, you know, you want to learn how to make an omelet? Well, look up YouTube, YouTube. Yep. right? Yeah. Instead of like, no, get the pan and let's crack some eggs, you know? Mm-hmm. It's like, oh, YouTube, that's okay, Teflon pan, got it. Uh, eggs frothy, got it, okay. I'm just, you know, I know how to make an omelet. And that's not how I was, I was, you know, us was like, you know, full on, you know, every single detail, there's a, there's a technique for every ingredient and sure. you better know them all. And, you know, that's the kind of stuff that I was raised with. So it's natural for me. You know? Well, and the whole uh, YouTube and easier education is almost a double edged sword because while you can get information more easily, you in large part become the curator of your own education. And so let's say, you know, for me as someone who does photography, let's say I know everything about everything, but I don't know how to pick the best camera. 
well, mm. in that case, I could be losing a lot of quality and a lot of the execution potential because, you know, I don't have someone else guiding me along that journey. And that's something that, you know, going in the pathway that I did where I didn't go to school for photography or any of that stuff, um, I do have, you know, those gaps in my education where I try and supplement them, but it's a, it's a case of you don't know what you don't know. Mm -hmm. And so people like yourself that are helping out, you know, up and coming chefs and wanting to impart their wisdom, that is, you know, that is almost a new curator of education. It's not necessarily, there are obviously a lot of people who go to colleges and whatnot, but more and more people, at least in my experience, are soaking up education through experience, much like you were saying. Mm -hmm. And so what would be some of your top advice for young people looking to get involved in the food and beverage business? Make sure you like it. Um, give it a test period. You know, don't go sp signing checks for culinary school and then leave there going like, ah, I'm not so hot on this. Because, uh, you know, get some practical experience. Make sure that you're passionate about it. Um, you know, find out why you want to do it. Um, what are your motivators? You know, what's your intent? Um, and then recognize that... Uh, there's going to be some sacrifice, particularly holidays and family stuff. And, and also recognize there's a tremendous reward in it. Uh, again, my, my intent was always to be really good at a trade. Like, like, you know, like that guy can play the guitar. Uh, like that guy got, has a hundred guitars. You know, I, I want to be the person who can cook. Not a guy, you know, not a guy that has a hundred restaurants. I mean, mm -hmm. maybe, you know, got to put the cart before the horse type thing. You know, I learned how to cook first and worry about getting a hundred restaurants. <laughs> but, uh, you know, that's the thing. It's like, don't, don't bite off more than you can chew. And granted, some people get lucky and, you know, they've been cooking for three years and they're the next star on television. You know, I mean, it just wasn't my experience. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I've been grinding away. Uh, and you know some some chefs nowadays want to be more of entertainers, and some want to be more educators, and others want to be you know more uh, shock value. And you know I just wanted to learn how to be a really good cook. Mm -hmm. So I would suggest that if you want to get into cooking, I hope you're into cooking. You know. Well, that's a really interesting lens to look through. Uh, Marcy, were you going to say something? Oh, I was just going to mention the fact the number of chefs that went through the kitchen at Mary Elaine's that are now running their own restaurants in, in Phoenix is, and beyond. It's, it's just really remarkable. We were kind of talking about this before the podcast, mm -hmm. and I just was wondering if you wanted to speak to that as well. Sure. Well, I mean, I've, I've been fortunate. Another thing my father taught me is like surround yourself with people that are potentially better than you. <laughs> and that's what I've done. I surround myself with good people. And I, as a matter of fact, two of, two of my, uh, my colleagues, um, both one James Beard, best chef Southwest. And, you know, one of them was a sous chef and one of them came to me as a cook. Uh, I have a lot of uh, other guys who came and work with me. Uh, we work together at the Phoenician, and you know they're the vice president of food and beverage at the Cosmopolitan and Aria, and executive chef at the, the you know Bellagio and all these. I mean, so we it's about development of a culture, which is very important. Uh, and I'm trying to develop that culture here. And, and, you know, if you come here, and, you know, after we've been open a month and, and don't quite get that experience, it's, it, culture takes time. Uh, but we certainly have our eye on the ball. And, and that's what I love to see is that what I was taught, uh, I taught somebody and they're teaching somebody. I mean, that's, that's really, that's, that's the impact. I mean, that's whether it's a legacy, it's certainly not my legacy. I'm just part of a legacy of passing it on. You know, and I mean, my, my mentors, you know, self, me self mentorship is the YouTube way, you know, you, mm -hmm. you, you're always right if you're the one giving yourself advice, right? Sure. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's a question of, of having somebody to look to. Yeah. Well, that's, I was saying that's a, it's a really interesting and powerful lens to look at any career, but food and beverage specifically, because there's so many things to learn. It's not just how to cook this one thing, but it's how to cook it and get it out on time, how to do it and have it in front of someone in a way that they can experience it to its fullest potential. And there's so much more that goes into that than a lot of consumers or people looking to get into the industry probably realize. And 
to take that piece of advice that your dad gave you about surround yourself with people who are better than you. That's one of those things that no matter what industry you get into, if you're constantly exercising that and bringing your own aspect of value to it, most of the time you're going to flourish at mm -hmm. least in some capacity. And I think, um, for, for anyone who's looking to get into the industry, I'm not necessarily in food and beverage industry, but that's a piece of advice that I, you know, hold dearly to myself. And, uh, it's, it's also interesting to see the way that that kind of the, the passion that you have for cooking and all the things that you've learned, if other people have that same mentality of surround yourself with people that are better than you and come to you to learn and then continue that chain on, mm -hmm. then food and beverage and society as a whole really should only get better from there on. And I think, you know, that also ties into the golden rule thing that you were saying of mm -hmm. treat other people's better than yourself. So um, let's look at where you are now in your career. Is this the only restaurant that you're associated with currently? Yes. This okay. Is it. And so what are kind of your plans with this place? Well, what, what I'd like to do is, is um, two things. I'd like to expand this into a place that we might be able to build a, uh, a wine bar, <coughs> a wine retail, cheese, charcuterie, uh, different types of olive oils, really high-end stuff, um, cheeses especially, meats, uh, gosh, you know. Uh, sell some local breads from Noble Bakery, sell some pasta from Sonoran Pasta, you know, bring some of that, maybe some, even some produce, just a couple of things here and there. <clears throat> In the bigger picture, I'd like to do more of these specific restaurants. Um, you know, do one thing well. I wouldn't mind putting, getting three or four of these around here in the valley. Um, until we have a really good establishment and then maybe look outside of the valley. But, <clears throat> you know, being boots on the ground and being at the places is really important. Absolutely. And, you know, let's say best, best case scenario, you, you got it down after six months. You know, you can only do <laughs> two a year. It takes a while. But, uh, again, surrounding myself with people who get it will make that a lot easier. But I do want to, I would love to see a compo in Arcadia. I would love to see a compo in North Scottsdale. Uh, I would love to see a compo wine bar in Enoteca, you know, where you, when you go get pasta and we have, give you little recipes for it and we do some cooking demos and, and some wine tastings and some cheese tastings, you know, that kind of just neighborhoody stuff that, 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 and this particular neighborhood and this particular area is re, I think is really, wanting for that mm -hmm. uh i don't think there's a wine store in the three mile radius hmm. oh, and may, yeah, maybe there is yeah yeah and just to establish the fact we're um on the northwest corner of hayden and via de ventura mm -hmm. thank you yeah just in case in we didn't mention that in the first place you know mccormick ranch it's 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 really nice and there's you know i wouldn't call it a bedroom community but there's a lot of <laughs> there's a lot of homes up here with people who do like to go out Mm -hmm. and do have children who want to, they want to take a break from them and enjoy themselves a little bit. So, Well, I live about 10 minutes up the 101, and, um, you know, I drive around a lot distributing magazines and doing all that, and this is one of those areas that, uh, especially a little bit closer to me, there's not too much local food and beverage. This area, you're kind of getting a little bit closer to Old Town, so it almost, the more south you go from where I live, the mm -hmm. more saturated it gets. Uh, but as much as uh, local food and beverage can creep up into my neighborhood. I'm more and more happy about that. So Good. I'm excited to have you guys in the neighborhood. When someone comes in, is there anything in particular that you might recommend to really give them kind of an embodiment in terms of a dish that kind of encapsulates this new evolution of your cooking methodology or ideology? <coughs> That's a tough question because <laughs> there's so many things I'd like for people to try. Oh, gosh. I mean, Maybe just name a few then. Sure. Well, I think our lasagna is dynamite. I think the cacio pepe pasta is very good. Um, I love our uh, our bar snacks. Like we, I, just something is like the eggplant puree. Come try it; it's really good. Or the caponata, which is another really good one. Uh, I think that the transports people into like this is what it should really taste like. Because I spend a lot of time researching it, and like this is some Sicilian grandmother told me this tastes just like hers. That's like the biggest compliment you can get. Sure. You know, those are the types of things that uh, I want people to try and have them transported. If, if anything, I would prefer them to, to compare something familiar and, and be able to establish, be established them as, uh, you know, the best version of 
X, Y, and Z, even mm-hmm. if it's just grilled bread with olive oil. You mm-hmm. know, wow, this bread's unbelievable. And you that's know. kind of the essence of Italian cooking. It's yes. very simple, yes, with, yes, with fresh, delicious ingredients. Yeah. So, uh, you know, again, I, I'm, I am, I'm the handler of product. <laughs> you know, I'm trying to present stuff in, in their simplest form with a lot of thought and execution behind it. But essentially, I want it to look like it was no effort, where it was a lot of effort. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. You know, if it's just a bowl of, you know, roasted fennel and blood oranges, you know, it, it's not just that. It's, you know, where'd you get it? How'd you do it? You know, well, it's like that meal that you described as the best meal that you've ever had, the, the peaches with ice cream. It's yeah. super simple, but just executed flawlessly. Yeah, yeah. and that's, that's what I want to do. That's, that's for sure. You know, I equate it back to music. You know, the blues scale, it's only a few notes. But boy, when you hear somebody play the blues, you know, that's Absolutely. like... You feel it. Absolutely. You know? Well, this was a real pleasure sitting down with you. It's exciting to see kind of how your career has come full circle now and has hit a point where you seem very happy with the direction things are going. And it's, yeah. it's really fulfilling for you. So that's exciting. And I'm excited personally to come in and try some of the food because I'm hearing too. you talk through those dishes, yeah. I'm like, my stomach's starting to rumble. Over here. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Well, Marcy, Our daughter thank you. loves Cacio e Pepe, so we will oh. definitely be here very soon. <laughs> Good. Let me know. Yes. For sure. I'll, I'll do it myself just in case. Uh, <laughs> awesome. Well, yes. Fantastic. Well, Alex, thanks so much for sitting down with us. Marcy, it's a thank pleasure you, having Marcy. you on thank board you. as well. Thanks for having me. Thank you very much. Thank yep. you.